Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Hello. We are back. And I just figured out how to do that while we were on air, how to do a double episode. So we are back with the iconic, absolutely fabulous Dickie Smothers. We were in our first part of the episode, we were talking about how Dickie and his brother Tom were true trendsetters in the 60s. They were very controversial. They were incredible musicians. Dickie's got his gold records behind him. Um, so, uh, just amazing. Uh, Dickie, let's pick up where we left off. You were talking about being a trendsetter. And indeed, I want to kind of pick apart in the 60s, you talked about and poked fun at religion, sexuality, the war, so many hot topics that you and Tom actually paid the price and were yeah. fired for that. Um, about, and you poked fun at censorship because you were being censored all along. Yeah. Can you talk about that part of your journey? Oh, yeah. We did, and we, we get credit from, you know, like the, the comedians today, the political comment, the, 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 the outrageous things that they get away with with the Internet. Uh, we, we just had television. You had to tune it on. Now there's hundreds of millions of people worldwide hear every, every utterance. And uh, we, uh, we were really, the networks were scared to death of the negative letters. So the censorship was the continuity, they called it continuity censorship. They, they were really strong and they exerted a lot of pressure. We thought we had freedom of speech rights, which is what we have. Everybody talks freedom of speech. Next to gun, freedom of guns, freedom of speech. And both are used recklessly and without... Uh, Anyway, that's another. That's the. That's a, another, another whole show. That's part three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we 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 did things. We poked we poked fun at, and we had to couch thing and cover it up. So we we sound really. We were really weak and polite compared to today. But uh, John Stewart and these late night people, uh, they talk. Uh, we were the first show that was in the entertainment. Let's say family viewing hour. Nine o'clock Sunday night, the most watch hour in television all week was nine o'clock Sunday night, and they dropped us in that spot, and and CBS had tried six times to uh, to have a good ratings against Bonanza, failed every single time. So when they offered it to us, Tommy said, "Well, we'll just we don't have a shot." I said, "Tommy, that's that's a that's a terrible spot." He said, "Then someone said." It's the best shot. How often is anybody offered an hour variety show of their own? And how often does it happen to the most watched hour of the week? Yeah, I guess Bonanza, but maybe we'll be different. We can't fail because everybody fails. So with real low expectations from the networks, oh, they gave us creative control. They gave us everything we wanted, basically, which they don't. And we said, we want all young writers. We are these young writers. Because the old guys, they just write old stuff. We didn't want that. So they gave us that. And they gave us a lot of stuff, creative control. And as soon as it became a, this looked like it's going to be a big hit, they said, we don't mind you being controversial, but we want everybody to agree with you. I don't think those two things go together very well. <laughs> yeah. So that was the, the, the yin and yang. The, 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 the networks, I don't, most people don't realize, they only owned about six stations that they were called the owned and operated, no one knows. The rest were affiliates. And they, nobody had to sign up for our show in their affiliate lineup if they didn't want it. In the Midwest, we had a lot of people who didn't take our show. And uh, so they, I could understand their side of it, but they, they gave us rules to follow that weren't written down. It's like having a motor vehicle code. You get pulled over for a violation, and they said, you violated this law. They said, but where is it written down that that's the law? Well, we don't write them down. We just tell you when you broke it. And so we didn't have any guidelines per se, and we were always respectful. You know, the humor, humor 
without you, Will Rogers, beloved early 20th century comedian, he said, never bet a man I didn't like. And he had wonderful things. Well, political humor is the court jester. If the, he didn't please the king, if he did a little sartat, well, off with his head. Well, <laughs> they didn't cut off our head because they didn't like it. But they made sure they created a situation where they would cause litigation and get us off the air. And we, uh, we were picked up for our third year. Uh, actually, the start, we were, it was funny, we had two and a half years because we were mid-season, but for the third uh, full season, and we were already picked up, and they uh, claimed we didn't, they made us change the rules. After we taped the show in, CB, in Hollywood on uh, Friday night, someone had to, we'd ed, they'd edit it, put it in a, in a little bag, in a box, and someone would fly up to New York to give it to New York. So they could pre-screen for all the affiliates that were scared of our show, afraid of our show. My God. And so Tommy didn't like that. And somehow uh, he, he had the, the tapes and they didn't show up. And then they couldn't find my brother for a while. He was he was in San Francisco scouting. We wanted to, to, to tape the show in San Francisco like uh, Jackie. Uh, oh, Jackie. Uh, um, uh, who's a big fat comedian, the big guy, the Honeymooners. Oh, Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason was in Miami. You know why he was still in Miami? He liked playing golf there. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was funny. So we like San Francisco. And we and things were all set up for the next year. And then they just pulled the plug. And things don't happen by accident. That was a, in some ways, yeah, we stopped. We, we could have been moguls. We had, uh, we had so many, we had production things set up. We had the personnel. We, we were produced, we first produced the Glenn Campbell show. We did other things. And Tommy made big inroads in writers. The writers couldn't get a job unless they had credits. And they couldn't get a credit unless you had a job. Tommy got it. So we had intern writers. They didn't get paid. But if they... They worked with the writers that could hang around, and if they put in a bit that got on the show at all, they got credit. They got credit. That was their toe. No, that's their whole body in the door. When we were fired, every writer, guy, everybody jumps on, on the carcass of the dead show and tries to pick all the good people out, and they all had great jobs. Sonny and Cher followed us. They had all our crew, and CBS called it uh, the People at CBS call it the Sonny and Cher Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. <laughs> Why was it important for you and Dickie to push the envelope the way you did? I, I am Dickie. I am sorry. Why? I you are Dickie. Um, Mom always was, liked you best. You always liked my Dick. brother best. <laughs> what? That was supposed to be Dickie, comma. Yeah. Why was yeah. it important for you and Tommy to push the envelope the way you did? Because it was the right thing to do. Think about it. This is the right thing to do. We didn't have a template. Right we did, yeah, we didn't have a template, but we didn't start the first number of shows. They weren't. There's nothing in that first season that was earth shattering, but it was going towards that. And it's like the times created the content and where our minds went. The, the college kids were protesting, doing all this kinds of stuff all over the country. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, folk thing, all that was happening. We were getting engaged. The young people were getting engaged with the politics and the moral issue of the moral issue of draft. They could, they could take you and put you in a situation where you get killed or dismembered. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Vietnam was building up, and that was a bogus war. Uh, there's always some political side. No, it's justified. And I think the Gulf of Tonkin incident was some something at sea that caused a justification to go over there and kick ass. And uh, it, it was it was bogus. And uh, and and yet my heart, I, I didn't like people, young people protesting, kids going to the post office to sign up for the draft. That was the law. You sign up, you register. I would have registered. I was but out of high school. I was already in the army. I, I got into the the, uh, the um, reserves and I did active duty for a while, and uh, I I said these kids can sign up 
or they could go to Canada. My uncle loved my dad. Dad was a my dad was a West Pointer. Uh, uh, in 1929, he graduated. Was a career army man, and we were all in the Philippines before World War II, and it was heating up. And they they evacuated all the military dependents, and my mom was, and Tommy and I were little kids. Mom was pregnant with my younger sister, uh, going off in a ship with other dependents to what they had no idea what would befall them. No, they didn't know the Japanese were six months away from attacking Pearl Harbor. Uh, they, they, that's where they were going to attack the Philippines. So they just got rid of uh, all of us for our own safety. And life happened. My, that, my dad was a prisoner the whole time. Got, he died before the end of the war. Mom was settled out in Winston-Salem, where dad was from, Southern California. They worked in a defense plant, built P-38 planes with grandpa. And grandpa was, you know, the, the tides and tide of things. And when they dropped us, we had the right sensitivity, maybe because of dad and and things like that. But it was the right thing for a young person to do, to question, to question. And we, we attracted writers. We were more of the, 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 more was said on our show because we were attracted to what they had to say. So we gave them a place. Uh, David Steinberg, the, the religious sermonette, that he claimed he got us fired, but he didn't. He just liked to say that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and then the, uh, the, uh, the, we, we, we were anti-smoking thing. We did, and, and tobacco was one of our sponsors. We, we just did things that uh, young people could relate to. We weren't, we weren't allowed to swear. A frigate. Frigate, Tommy we couldn't. So we did a thing uh, with uh, George uh, Siegel, uh, a skit on Mutiny on the Bounty, a musical. And Tommy would like to use the said a, a dog was rather a, a frog was croaking, and it, it sounded like ribbit, ribbit. And Tommy liked to say frigate because it almost it's, a, it's an F word. How how nice, how silly that is. So he did a whole thing built around. Uh, I'm captain of the frigate. I like to ride the frigate. I mean, we did silly things. And we also did stuff that had such meaning. Uh, David Fry did some of the greatest Nixon stuff. And, you know, they didn't have a sense of humor much. Uh, Lyndon Johnson complained. You know, he took over. And then the, the war became his in Vietnam. He was having so all the top guys socialized. President of CBS Television Network. Of course, he's going to sit down with the president and talk about the most talked about show they had. They said, we had, the Smothers Brothers have one hour a week, and we spend more time trying to tell them what not to say than all the other shows combined. And, and President Johnson said, you know, my daughter, I don't know, Lucy Bird or whoever she's called, really loves the show. It, you know, But I wish they'd go easy on the war. <laughs> uh, there was a cartoon in Esquire. Uh, with Tom and Dick in Congress, and the speaker of the Congress was hammering on the elector and saying, "Let's have order while we get our advice from the Smothers Brothers." You know, we were, it went up and down. Tommy speak spoke to, to the government, and the NAB can he got too serious. Tommy towards the end there, the third season, Tommy said, uh, "I got too serious and I lost my sense of humor." So. Well, what lessons do you think today, you had alluded earlier about how you were very tame, if you will, compared to today. But today yeah. we have, I think we have these opposites of we have censorship in certain states, particularly about books being banned. We have certainly very diverse uh, political places. <laughs> how do you think the work that you did then rubs up against what we see today? Uh, I think, well, this, by the way, we haven't studied, we haven't pre-reviewed uh, the questions. This is off the top of my head, but from stuff that I've thought for a long time. Uh, I, I think we were sort of, well, how did Wilbur and Orville Wright affect the jets and the space program? Their plane barely went a few hundred yards uh, but and I know today I could design a much better plane 
than the Wright brothers, right? But who cares? That's not very good, is it? Uh, it's the timing. We, we opened the door, and then, the, then it took a while for technology to create what we have today. It, it is the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, we get credit for saying, and not 100% rightfully so, but maybe to some sort of an extent, of uh, letting the things that were said at late night back then said with the broad audiences. And it wasn't sexual. It was none of that. It was content, the content of what's the right thing to say and do with your life. I, I, uh, I, I met some really good people in the 12-step program, and I, and I became, that changed my life 31 years ago. It, what did that first inkling that maybe I could use some help with my life and my direction and do the right thing? And it started slow, and now I can't, I can't believe I ever was a different person, and I can't believe looking at what we had now, on on all the social platforms, the media platforms, of how limited it was when we were the cutting edge, we were the cutting edge of television, and but then then and we look back at oh poor radio, all they had. Radio, what did you do? And then go before radio, it was whistle stopping. If you were a political guy, you got on a train and you stopped in a town and hoped somebody show up to the caboose where you were preaching to, or some soapbox. And then before that, there were huge, immense crowds. But it was difficult in those other days. You had now today for anybody to make it in the business, it's almost unfair for these guys dealing with nothing just a platform of information, are billionaires. Uh, billionaires should have build tractors or cars or, you know, something you could sit on and look at and weighs a lot. It takes a lot of effort, you know. But no, now you got an idea, boom, you're a billionaire. Uh, no, that's just a start. A hundred billionaire. So thoughts are amazing. And what we did, which we didn't know, is what we're doing right now. We're saying things... They could be meaningless, but a few people are going to say, well, I was there, and that's interesting. And other, we had, when we were at our peak, there were so many people say, they're just stupid. I mean, my God, I'm not going to look at them. You know, you always get, now today, they just give you not likes. You know, how right. many likes you get? Right. Well, I know when I did early AA meetings, they said, oh, I got a lot of nods. Well, you don't share your sobriety struggles for nods. You do it because it's the right thing, and you might help another struggling person. Uh, that could be a, a struggling person with their character. If you see someone who could give you, well, I thought, you know, you know all those apostles that Jesus had in 12, some of them just wanted more sheep or more fish, or they were hungry. It, it, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the riots and the demonstrations in the 60s, not everybody had a deep-seated, I'm doing the right thing. Most of them came for the party. So, you know, but doing the right thing, you'll, you'll attract a lot of people that say, right on, and other people want to ride on your back and fake it, and other people that say, you're the devil in, incarnate, and you've got to be strong enough to accept all those things. So I think by accident, there are no accidents. Somehow, we did the right thing, and I'm so proud Oh, God, I, I tear up when I'm so proud of my brother. He did it. He, in his whole life, he was always the guy to jump in and, and try to get a bully off of a, of a, a weaker person. He would jump in. He would, he would campaign for presidential nominees when he knew they were going uh, uh, to lose. He, he liked to get on the, on the underdog side, and he did the right thing, and he taught me a lesson. Well, watching the love that you and Tommy shared, because um, I know you in later life, but watching that love uh, continue, um, it, was, it makes me tear up knowing that. Well, my brother is not dead. Shakespeare is not dead. Jesus Christ is not dead. You know, if you leave your mark and people think about your, read your, sing your songs, or see your old videos, I see. I love old movies, and every one of those people 
physically are dead, but they're sure not dead. And my brother is right here. Absolutely. And, you know, the storytellers show here today, you know, you talked about doing the right thing. I'm so glad that you chose to be on the show to leave your mark on the world um, through the art of all of your storytelling and all of Tommy's yes, story and his work. Thanks for having me here. And, you know, you're, you're my friend for a long time, and that's not an accident. Thank you for being my friend. Love you, dear friend Dickie. Um, thanks Love for being on the show. Uh, this has been a double episode of The Storytellers, copyrighted by Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network, Grace Savin, and the fabulous, absolutely great, Vicki Smothers. Thanks for being with us. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.